What I don't like is a disjointed and let's say non-science-based reactionary policy tact that they're taking. I, I don't think it's responsible. And I don't think it's a, it's a, a long-term play. You're listening to the Drone Radio Show podcast, the show about drones and the people who use them for business, fun, and research. Hosted by Randy Goers. Hello, everyone. This is Randy Goers, and welcome to the Drone Radio Show podcast, episode 113. Do you know who's advocating for your use of drones? If you ask today's guest, he'd most likely respond with an uncomfortable sigh. Patrick Egan is the editor of the America's Desk at SUAS News and host and executive producer of the SUAS News podcast series, Drone TV, and the Small Unmanned Systems Business Exposition. He is also the director of special programs for the Remote Control Aerial Photography Association. Patrick has spent the last 10 plus years working as a proponent for the business use of unmanned aircraft systems. He's here to talk about current efforts to integrate drones into the national airspace. We'll also talk about local and federal regulations, the state of the drone industry, and he'll share his view on who's really looking out for your interests as a small commercial drone business. The answer may surprise you, and it could involve a mirror. Now before we hear from Patrick, if you like the drone radio show and feel it provides value, please consider supporting my funding campaign on Patreon. The content is always free, and for as little as $1 per month, you can help keep the show growing and going. To donate, go to patreon.com slash drone radio show. So now let's talk about the state of the drone industry with Patrick Egan. Let's pick up the interview where I asked Patrick to give us his view of where the Drone Advisory Committee is today after its first three meetings and where things are headed. Well, some people have said, you know, oh, well, you know, the DAC's working on this and that. We've got these experts. And uh, I I don't know if you follow me on the Twitter, but uh, I, I've basically said I have no confidence in the DAC anymore. And people that are on the DAC are like, how could you say that we're unqualified? And I just say Nancy Egan. And usually the crickets are chirping on the other end of the, the phone. The DAC thing, if you read the FACA, uh, it's the uh, Federal Advisory Committee Act. GSA's got one version. FAA's got their own version. The whole idea with that act was put together in the 70s is transparency and efficiency. And I haven't seen anything in the, let's say, airspace integration effort that is anything like that in my basic, I, I guess we're going on about 13 years of interfacing with the FAA on UAS NAS integration. You know, people, oh, I'm going to, you know, it's all happening over on ASTM or RTCA. I think uh, RTCA is is in danger of wrecking their credibility. You know, I mean, they, they had the S. C203 go on for 10 years with nothing. They had a sunset it. They started up the uh, the 228, I think it is now. RTCA is running the DAC. The whole thing is a, you know, private public rulemaking thing. And people, well, I don't, you know, I don't know if that's fair. Hey, if you're having backroom meetings with people about the future of what I want to do as a business and, and you're not going to tell me, not only are you not telling me, you're not even telling Congress what's going on. Something's wrong. And, you know, well, you know, the FAA, oh, this is, you know, this is how rulemaking gets done. You know, they give us some, they give us their take on things. They advise us. We get a consensus. When we get a consensus, then we can go public. With what? You know, something that's cockamamie. And I, I'm not even really talking about what's going on over there, but people should be alarmed. It's, it's, it's beyond the pale. Of what's going on. And I think we need to, you know, as an industry, you got to decide, you know, these are aircraft or are they hair dryers? Are they consumer electronics or are they something you want to go out and do commercial work with? Yeah, it's another thing people are talking about, you know, well, you know, oh, these, these hobbyists are out here and they need education, you know. Well, I don't really think it's the, the AMA people that need to be educated and registered. I, I think that's like registering the choir. 
So who should we be concerned with? I don't really think, you know, the guy or gal that gets the 107 and goes through the TSA background check, that is the, the FAA should be concentrating on that person and saying, you know what, we've got to bend over backwards. We have to facilitate what the person that's legally operating commercially is doing. So, you know, it's not going to be 90 days to get them a waiver to fly in Class C or, or you know, whatever. Uh, we're going to try and do what we can to facilitate that. Then you have, you know, the we'll just call them the 200,000 AMA members. They already have their own deal, write their name on their aircraft, yada, yada. So it's the group between that, the 600 and some odd thousand people that aren't really hobbyists. Those people went to the big box stores. They bought a drone. Not a lot of people went out and said, hmm, you know, I'm going to drop. I, mean, I think I'm going to spend a thousand bucks or fifteen hundred bucks. So I could just take selfies for the rest of my life with this drone. A lot of these people are going to say, well, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to pick up some weekend money doing photography or whatever. Now I, I go to, you know, I do the reality check. I go to Fry's. They got two drone aisles. Not one mention that there's the FAA, there's rules. You got to read nothing. I go over to Best Buy. I, I talked to the girl over there. I said, hey, you know, how many of these drones you got? You know, she's like, oh, I can't afford any drones. How many do you have? And I go, I got a mess in them, you know, and I teach and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, there are rules. There's rules. You need a license? Shocked. She didn't know what's going on. So who's, you know, who's, who's doing the, uh, I call it kind of the wham, bam, thank you, sir or ma'am or whatever. You know, I'm going in there. I'm dropping my money. I get my drone. I leave. I charge it up and I start flying and I don't know that there's rules or anything else. So, you know, if, if all of these companies and, and big box stores and everything else there, you know, are you, do you have a social con conscience? You know, do you, do you owe your customers something? Some folks at, at some of the drone companies are like, Oh, you know, we don't owe our customers anything. You buy the products. It's on you to figure it out and do whatever you want to do. That doesn't sound like we're, you know, concerned about safety and the NAS, or we're concerned about not having near misses, or we're concerned about X, Y, Z, and all the rest of that. So is this something that the FAA is supposed to handle, or is it just not on the agenda? You know what? I just don't. I think if you really want to educate people, you have a well thought out and effective enforcement program. And, you know, let's flash back to the Taylor case. During the Taylor case, they FOIA'd from the FAA, the, the enforcement actions that went down. And, and I want to say, and I can't remember for sure, but I think it was like 48 enforcement actions. Not one of them used the registration. Remember the registration was going to, everyone's going to get educated. We're going to have accountability. People aren't going to be flying near airports, yada, yada. The, the numbers are all going up. You know, so obviously it didn't work. Now, you know, another interesting tidbit is the NFL you know, those guys, they play that thing called the Super Bowl every year, approach the FAA to do PSAs about not flying at stadiums and whatever else. It's like, <laughs> you know, they're serving it up to you on a silver platter and you didn't even do the work. OK, to you, you cut out a PSA during the Super Bowl. Could have worked that out. 113 million people watched that thing. And then there were another 190 million social interactions on social media during the Super Bowl. So you could have had the drone thing on there. Everybody would have been talking about it. You know, you probably had, you know, 200 million people know that you can't fly drones over stadiums or that there are rules and know before you fly. And an opportunity was just missed. So it almost seems to me like the FAA is kind of like, oh, well, golly, we don't know what to do and we don't have – staff and we don't have any money and we don't have this and we don't have that and we don't have any ideas and we need these advisory committees. I think what's happening with all of the, the companies in the FAA, you're at the bitter end of the rope on plausibility. I, I'm not buying it anymore. And I think a lot more people aren't buying it anymore. And I will say that the old guard in this industry is kind of saying, hey, you know, the kids have been at this for a while and the adults have to step in and, and clean up the mess. And uh, I don't know if the FAA is going to start listening to people that know what's going on. You know, that's the same thing with this DAC thing that I'm, I'm having an issue with right now is FAA picks who's on it. As far as the DACs are concerned, anybody that was on the registration task farms that's on the DAC now is totally discredited them themselves, especially after the Taylor case. We have both Congress saying that don't make any rules for the hobbyists, and we have the courts backing them up on it. And you have all of the advocacy groups 
and the OEM mouthpieces and all the rest of that stuff are all saying, hey, Congress, no, hold on, wait, the DAC knows better, the FAA, there were, you saw the advocacy groups come out and make statements, no, 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 we trust the FAA, you're taking away tools, you're, you're, you know, hey, man, something's wrong here. You should be advocating for your members who are trying to make an honest living, not you know, registering hobbyists or people that aren't even hobbyists, they're non-certificated 107 people. And there are tools. There's just no enforcement program. So I, I think we're kind of at a, um, let's say, a dark day with the regulatory thing. And then, you know, that segues right into where I think the industry's at. And I might be jumping ahead on that one, but. I just have one follow-up question on the FAA part. Do you think we're headed for a different set of rules for heavy commercial users? Well, I mean, you know, here's the other thing with 107. I, and I you know, have conversations with all kinds of people from all over the world on this deal. I think we got more in 107 than, than we really thought we would. I think 107 is really liberal. Um, what happened with that, it was, it was kind of political pushing that kind of got that out. Was it well thought out? Maybe not so much. I, I think the FAs kind of painted themselves into a corner with enforcement, you know, uh, with that. Do I think that the rules are going to change for commercial people? Probably. I mean, a lot of people are kind of amazed that there's no practical part of a 107 test. And so I can fly a 55-pound drone that flies at 100 miles an hour. I can fly it around. I don't, I don't need to, to get trained. I don't need to prove to anybody that I can fly that. In the NPRM, I, even the comments I made, I said, you know, that's that's a little beyond my comfort level. But, hey, you know, the FAA, I'm going to defer to the FAA because they're the expert on this one. So I think that's probably going to change, you know. And then also, you know, there's lots of talk about the UTM. And I, and I wrote an article about that, the Intergalactic UTM Association. This, this one cracks me up, too. It's like, you know, I, I have like four questions I ask people. And I've asked like all of the associations What's this thing going to look like? How much do we need? Where's it going to be? And who's going to pay for it? You know, if you parse out the numbers of who registered what, basically, okay, we got 40 some odd plus or minus thousand commercial drones registered. And, you know, UTM, realistically, you have nationwide UTM. You know, what's that going to cost? A couple of hundred million dollars. So the user fees are going to be pretty high for that. And then, oh, you know, ASD, ADSB, you know, the FAA has been poo-pooing ADSB for drones since, you know, 2005 or six. Uh, it could work. It'd be a large investment, and it'd have to be space-based. The other one you hear, oh, well, we're going to use the cell phone network. Lots of problems with the cell phone network, you know, not reliable, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, the thing is with that is, is do you really even need – you know, a full-blown UTM system in Corn Bluff, Iowa, population 250. You know, a guy wants to do some cornfields out there. There's really no airplane traffic. There's no people on the ground. Yes, the aircraft could get, get away. So maybe, you know, the manufacturer is going to have to up their mean time between failures. They're going to have to be better than hobby grade. Maybe the guy needs another endorsement. You know, hey, uh, you know, to fly beyond visual line of sight, you need to know X, Y, Z. You need to know this. You have to have that aviation band radio. You have to be able to, you know, contact the tower. Whatever. I don't think it's beyond the reach of reasonable people to figure this out. So given where things stand, who has to step forward to get the conversation moving towards something that many would feel is more practical? In this situation now with the DAC and whatnot, I, I think, I mean, listening, I wrote an article about that. I went up to Reno and I'm listening to people. And this is supposed to be immediate solutions, uh, 12 to 24 months. And it seems like the people that have money or come from the big money groups or businesses like some of the Internet companies, they're allowed to just kind of run off at the face with nonsense. You know, they are not experts in their field. They just have a company with lots of money. Um, the other thing I think is is the FAA seeds these committees with people who are going to be yes people. And this isn't even my opinion. You know, you look at what happened on the registration task force, and I believe there's a direct correlation. And again, this isn't even just you know me. This is other people in the industry. You know, one of them was the guy from Atlanta Hobbies that he said that after the drone registration task force kicked in that his business was off 
Okay. The other thing is you had all these uh, these financial forecasts, and it's up two hundred and fifty percent year to year. And oh God, we're selling drones like hotcakes, and they're, we're blowing them out. And I don't know what they were blowing out because if you look at the reality, you know, Parrot lost a hundred million dollars. That's not year to year growth, two hundred and fifty percent. Okay. DJI, I know they lost money, and I know they lost. I don't know how much. I'm not going to say they're losing money, but they're losing market share. The engine's slowing down. They're not selling as many drones as they had hoped to. Sales were strong. They're still killing it. But I, I don't believe people would come out with mea culpas and white papers based on fantasy saying that they were wrong about 250 grams in the registration task force if sales weren't down. Also, you look at Unique. Unique let everyone go. 3DR lost $125 million. Now, these are the high-flying companies. GoPro's got one foot on the banana peel, you know, and I don't know if it's only because of the drone, but the, the drone was a complete and utter disaster, you know, and there were several reasons for that. But uh, again, people were buying their own nonsense uh, was one of the big problems, the, the propaganda. But the, the upshot on that is even before people, there were the, the cracks were starting to show in the facade, I had been in contact with company representatives from, from all of the companies and I could not get one of them. To say that they were 250% year to year, 200% year to year, or even 100% year to year growth. So I don't know if it was the toy stuff at the gas stations and the mall kiosks and all the rest of that stuff that were up all that much. But uh, nobody was near that, and we've seen the fallout of that, and the truth has shown. The other thing you have is you got the other big high flyers, the commercial companies, the drones as a service that were just going to kill it and knock them dead. Okay, you had Kespri. You had Precision Hawk. Now you have Airware. Airware, Jonathan Downey was like the superstar, and he's stepping down. So, you know, I kind of asked people over there at Kespri, because they were killing it, and I've asked the people over at Precision Hawk killing it. I likened it to, okay, so the you know Falcons or whatever win the uh, the championship, and we're going to the Super Bowl, and we're killing it, and it's just you can't get any better, and we, you know, we won the whole thing, but – we're getting rid of the coach. We're going to bring a new guy in for the Super Bowl. It just does not make any sense. I'm not buying that. So there's there's trouble in paradise. Where did the trouble in paradise come from? I think the main culprit from the trouble in paradise was the AUVSI forecast, the $82 billion, 90% of that. In part. You, you, you had people throwing money at drone companies. Oh, 90% of the $82 billion is going to be ag. Well, you know, you didn't even people didn't even read it. I didn't think, oh, that Egan guy. Oh, God, he's a downer. Oh, my God, he's like Eeyore. Did you read the forecast? You know, this is another thing. AVSI's uh, credibility right. with Congress is, is totally blown, shot through the grease. They were like, oh, you know, well, these were political numbers. Well, they turned out to be a complete fantasy. And now people in Congress feel like they've been lied to. And that's, again, not my opinion. That's word from the hill. So you have this perfect storm of hyperbole, of hype, snake oil. And, and I think that we're seeing the fallout from that now. Now you have these companies aren't really selling like they were. And, and from what I'm hearing, they're in full capitulation mode. Whatever FAA wants. Oh, okay, well, okay we'll, we'll do that. So do you feel that some companies are just looking for a silver bullet or a lifeline to pull them through whatever tough time they may be going through? Exactly. Until we can get enterprise off the ground or whatever, you know. But what we're starting to see, you know, you, like you said, you're in local government. You know, I don't know if at your government or local level, whatever, people are talking about drones. But there's a lot of concern at the state, county, and city level around the country. And what's happening is that we're getting like this patchwork of, let's say, ordinances and, and, and whatnot, uh, basically put together by people that don't really understand the technology. I think that's typically the case, at least from my experience. You have the public safety departments writing regulations from their perspective, or you get the land use and zoning people writing them from a business land use perspective. But no one's looking at them from an overall perspective of what do drone operators need or what does a drone-based business need to operate. Government really doesn't care about that. You know, I live in California, and I will say that the government is not in the business of, of making a good business climate for business. They don't care, you know. I think, you know, you have drones are a kind of a uh, popular subject. There's a lot of misconceptions about drones. And, and, you know, more and more I'm hearing about these local ordinances where people are like, well, you're going to get permission to fly over someone's property. 
killer. That is a killer. You know, when I was uh, prior to the ARC, even when I was on the RTCA thing, the FAA guy was like, oh, yeah, you were going to you're going to have to ask anyone's property you fly over. You're going to have to ask for their permission. I go, really? Is that how it works for manned aviation? Well, no, that's different because I go, well, I don't I don't really want planes flying over my house spewing lead. You know, in some states, uh, insurance isn't even mandatory. They crash into their, your house and kill you and you're in the lazy boy. Mm. Don't know what to tell you. I think that's another thing that we really have to come to terms with. 2012 reauthorization bill. These drones were aircraft. So are they aircraft? Are they hair dryers? You know, where are they? Are you going to have a foot in each camp? We're starting to see that the foot in each camp thing is not working. By your question, does that mean that there's a discussion occurring about whether UAVs are still aircrafts? Well, I think this is one of the problems that you have with this industry is, is people are... You know, when it suits them, they're consumer electronics. And when it suits them, they're aircraft. You know, it's always kind of been that way in this industry. Being here as long as I have, it's kind of funny. The visionaries were like, well, no one's ever going to regulate us because we're disruptive and we just, we, you know, innovate so fast. There's no way that the FAA can, you know, keep up with us. And then I was like, hmm, yeah, okay, all right. And, I mean, if you look where we've been, we did get regulated. Prior to the Taylor case going through, you got regulated. You were either 101 or 107, even though Congress said no. So, again, you know, if you look at it, the hobbyist, is the hobbyist flying an aircraft? Does the FAA regulate all the aircraft, hobby aircraft, commercial aircraft? You know, when is it a hair dryer? I think that whole consumer electronic thing, and even the Consumer Electronic Association, and this is another thing, this is another story that needs to be done, is there's actually one strong bully pulling the strings on Drone Manufacturers Alliance, now board member over to UVSI, you know, advising the Consumer Technology Association. So you have like one guy that's kind of doing all the policy for this. It's not good. I keep banging the drum that basically we don't have anyone in the advocacy thing that's advocating for the commercial end user. Uh, you do have the AMA trying to, um, let's say, advocate for their membership. But is that all the hobbyists? There's you know, people, oh, there's confusion about the CBO. What's a CBO? Well, really, right now, there's only one CBO, you know, and that's the AMA. So, and, and there's been the, uh, some confusion all along. People, I'm a hobbyist. I don't really make money with the drone. I make money doing post-processing with my video or my pictures or whatever. And still, people are playing games, and they're playing games because the FAA is not enforcing their own rules. And there's also a group of people that might call themselves hobbyists, but they wouldn't necessarily consider themselves a member of the AMA or part of any organization, Right. Well, and there's, you know, a few reasons for that. I mean, really, you know, AMA is an organization or association that's been around for a long time. They do have their own safety thing and their program by and large works, you know. However, that's not how most people fly quadcopters, okay. If you're flying, if you fly RC and you, I like scale, I like to fly scale or I like to fly gliders. And to be honest, the whole thing with flying gliders, which I used to do in the 80s, and the early 90s was is to get as high as you possibly could. You know, people are like, oh, the 400 feet. Well, that wasn't really, there wasn't a hard ceiling. You weren't supposed to fly above 400 feet, but people always did. I think the records were 4,000, 5,000 feet for gliders and stuff. Anyway, that's another story. But, uh, you know, it's a different thing. But, you know, you're out on an AMA field. People know you're there. Most, uh, like Sepulveda Basin is a good example Sepulveda Basin in uh, L.A., I think, is in the airspace of, of LAX. It's on the surface, of course. But they, they know where it is, and, they, and, and they've, they've been there for years. And it's not even AMA, but all these people go out there and fly. That's a little bit of a different model than me flying in my backyard uh, with my drone, especially if I don't know what I'm doing or flying over the neighbor's house, blah, blah, blah. I've had even my neighbors come out, what are you going to, oh, I don't like that. You're taking pictures of me. You can't do, you know, it's like, hey, I can fly over my property. I can't anymore because of the the new rule. I'm within five miles of an airport. I'm 3.3 miles from an airport. So even to fly in my yard, you know, I got to call and, and tell them I'm going to do it or whatever. But anyway, you know, that that person doesn't know that. They go to Fry's, they go to Best Buy, they get on Amazon, they buy a drone, whatever. They, they, nobody's thinking that there's any rules or that, you know, watch out for aircraft or I can't fly at the airport or I can't, 
you know, uh, fly over here, blah, blah, blah. That's totally another thing that the industry, I think, is shooting themselves in the foot. On one side, they talk out of the side of their face that they're all about safety. And then secondly, even their videos with their new product show people flying over or around people with drones, showing them with, you know, uh, wearing, you know, goggles where they can't maintain visual line of sight, giving their products to Internet stars who get on YouTube and do totally dangerous and reckless things with their products. And just because they want the views, they don't care. That's, you know, they totally don't care. So. I think that's another thing that this, this industry is suffering from is a lot of the advocates and experts and whatever else have run out the rope again on, let's say, semantics or, or being seen as being disingenuous. And it's, it's not helping any of us. Um, and I think that needs to be cleaned up. What do you think about the federal drone bill that was introduced by Feinstein and Blumenthal, the Drone Federalism Act? You know, I'm going to be honest. I haven't read it. There's another one someone sent me today. It's a a GOP house resolution, innovation, drone innovation or whatever. But I'm going to say anything that advocates for local municipalities or states coming up with laws for aircraft, no bueno in my estimation. You know, remember now the other place that we're going to be raking in the billions, you know, is this drones as a service thing. So you have some of those companies that are out there that are like, oh, we're drones in the service and we have pilots in every state and blah, blah, blah. You know, or even has a small business guy, you know, you know, oh, OK, well, if I'm in, if I work in this county, you know, the rules are X. If I work in the city, they're Y. If I go over here to the next county over, then the rules are totally different. So do I have to carry like different levels of insurance? Am I going to have to have different licensing? Am I going to have to register with the state? Am I going to do this? Am I going to have to ask for permission over here? You're going to create an environment where it is too, let's say, restrictive to make money. And then you have the interstate commerce rules. What if I do, you know, pipeline inspection or if I do smokestack inspection or I do tower inspection or whatever else? And I'm trying to do that in a multi-state region so I can actually make money. If we have different rules in all these municipalities and states, it's going to be very hard to comply. And, you know, the other thing that I think that people – you know, the hype and snake oil people came up with was is that these drones are magical and they do everything. I think the other realization that you're having here is, is that you can't do everything off the back of a consumer drone. Just not going to happen. Not working. What drones have always done, what the promise has always been, is to augment, and this is through my experience, 14 plus years of doing it commercially, is... They augment existing businesses. They allow experts, let's say, another data collection tool. And until such time as you have software that can take the expert out of the data collection and dissemination, analyzation process, it's just another video drone, you know, or another way to get video and still pictures of something. So, you know, I think a lot of people thought, you know, I'd go out here, spend a thousand dollars. Real estate agents are going to be banging down the door. I'm going to have farmers begging me. I'm going to have, you know, X, Y, Z. It's not really that easy. So the more regulation that you add on to this, the harder it is going to be to make a living. And I think that, uh, you know, anything that, that says uh, that we don't have like federal preemption or whatever, it, it's, it's just going to be too difficult. The other thing that you have is if these are aircraft. So I'm the drone guy, and i got to get permission to fly over my house. I, I don't want these guys flying over my house in, in uh, other aircraft. So, you know, I think you're going to open a Pandora's box. And I have to be honest, uh, even with that last statement that most of these groups, even HAI, NBAA, uh, AOPA, you know, if they're advocating for, you know, local municipalities to have more regulation on, on aircraft, I think they're really – begging for trouble, playing with fire. I haven't heard of any industry organizations supporting the bill. What I hear most is from local governments, primarily because it talks about federal preemption. And most local governments will be in favor of anything that preserves their home rule authority, even without understanding all of the implications. And my understanding is that it's somehow related to the FAA Reauthorization Act and is starting to get bogged down. Well, I, you know, we'll, we'll have to see what happens. You know, there's the, it's, it's hard to read the tea leaves. There's, uh, you know, I'm getting a lot of whispers from Washington that aren't encouraging. 
I know that some of the advocates and experts are like, you know, you're really beating up on us and that's not fair because you don't know how bad it can be or, you know, what they're talking about. Oh, I, I, I have a, a pretty good idea how bad it can be. And I'm going to say this, that the people who are advocating for basically for the OEMs because they're not advocating for us, even the world's largest advocacy group is not advocating for us, thought they were going to be able to game the system. And that blew up in their face. And we're going to we're all going to pay the price for that one. It will be very hard to come away from the new reauthorization unscathed. And the other thing is you have is, you know, you have kind of flying in the face of what Congress does. Congress makes the laws of the land. You have people saying, well, we support the FAA, and which is basically what I'm seeing is arbitrary policy over two branches of government being the, the Congress and the courts. And uh, you saw, you know, President Trump. It was kind of an interesting deal in the beginning when he talked about a private ATC that was seen as a shot across the bow. Even made comments about the administrator. You know, oh, that guy's a pilot, right? I mean, I I know that he already knows that Huerta was not a pilot. Huerta's experience was, uh, you know, he came up with some bus transit system for one of the Olympic Games. And I was one of the only people when, when he was up for confirmation that wrote a letter that said he's not qualified as far as I'm concerned, to be at the head of the FAA when we're talking about the, the serious issue of safely integrating drones into the NAS. You know, and I know the guy's he's not a fan of mine, but I don't really care. You know, people say, oh, well, you know, the Egan guy, oh, he's opinionated or whatever. Hey, and I, I, I just want people that are qualified for the job. My new program is, is basically I want transparency and efficiency in the public rulemaking. I don't want any arbitrary rules that are not based on science. We saw the detriment that the Drone Registration Task Force has done, and it's kind of pandemic around the world. You see all these other countries, up oh, 250 grams is the cutoff. Why is it 250 grams? It's 250 grams because it was based on junk science from a report from MITRE. You know, that's another people, oh, MITRE, you know, oh, there's this independent research group. Oh, horse pucky. Their main client is FAA and they're not going to bite the hand that feeds them. So, okay, we need something in here that says we can justify, we can, we can get something with it. Well, you know, I don't mean, I don't know all the particulars or whatever, but 250 grams is a very low weight to have registration for all drones for. And then you come back and this is another thing that kind of defies reason. So, you know, DJI supported the 250 gram registration thing and they come out with a spark that's 300 grams. I mean, does that sound like, I mean, you know, you could, you could shave 50 grams off. 50 grams isn't a lot. But it doesn't really sound to me like, you know, the right hand knows what the left hand's doing. And that's another thing we've got, too, with the situation where, with their products being used in um, Iraq and Syria and other places. Again, you know, they're talking about geofencing and limitations on people that are 107 pilots that have had TSA background checks, that have taken the tests, that are trying to do this legally. And over there, you have people dropping munitions on the coalition forces. It does not make you look, let's say, socially conscious. It does not make you look like you're playing with, a, um, let's say, a square game or above board. And then, you know, even that, they were like, oh, you know, well, we're going to do this. Well, we can do geofencing over there, too. And you have a guy with some uh, Reynolds wrap and a rubber band defeating it. Why don't you just, you know, you admit, hey, you know what? We can't really do something about this. You know, I, I, I don't know. You know, I don't know who's running the PR. I can't guess as to how it's working with the Chinese and then the American representation and whatever else. It, it seems like there's some confusion there, but the only thing you have to ask yourself is it that do you want a Chinese company driving the bus for rules, regulations, and laws for the United States national airspace system? Well, it's a question that has to be asked. I like DJI. People go, well, it sounds like a beautiful DJI. I like DJI. I have a lot of respect for Frank Wang. I even wrote a story. I called him the Steve Jobs of drones. They were right place, right time. They did a lot of the right things. They made a product at the right price that enabled people to do things. What I don't like is a disjointed and, let's say, non-science-based reactionary policy tact. 
that they're taking. I, I don't think it's responsible. And I don't think it's a, it's a, a long-term play. I think it's short-sighted just to keep the, the sales up. And I think the house of cards is going to come down. And I think we're going to, I think we're going to see it. I think we're going to see it sooner than later. Well, I think that's a good segue into what we might see happening in the industry over the next few years. What do you think? I think uh, one of the things is, and, and people are starting to realize this too, because this is another thing, you know, with the, and I, yeah, I don't want to just beat up on DJI, but they're doing the geofencing. Some of the other companies were like, yeah, we're going to geofence too. And then they quietly crabbed away from it. So people are asking, you know, what type of data is DJI collecting to make the geofencing system work? You know, and, and I think that's a fair question. But if you have to log in to their servers and the information's going, I don't know where, and your location data, you know, are we getting pics every so often or do they have access to the data? I know if you read the disclaimer, you know, I've got an Inspire one and it says on there, we may use some of your pictures, data, location information and things like that. Some businesses oil exploration, energy, uh, DOE, people like that may not want, or let's say may have a hassle with sharing some information with the Chinese. So I do think that there's a wide open space for an American or let's say domestic drone company. Unfortunately, this kind of goes back to the other thing that I just mentioned, that if you have a a well-entrenched, well-established Chinese company you know, let's say driving the bus on rules and regulation. I think it's going to be, I don't think you have to be like an Einstein or, uh, you know, Karnak or, or anyone else to figure out it's going to be really hard to start a company in the United States that's going to be able to compete with that, especially at those price points. So something to think about. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. You know, I don't uh, really do work where it's, you know, let's say sensitive that uh, I can't share the data. I think you bring up a good point. One of my roles is to act as the chair of a countywide all hazards mitigation working group. And I do know there's a lot of sensitivity about sharing data on critical facilities and their locations. Now, there's that. There's, you know, law enforcement's buying these. It's like, and, you know, I don't, we're still finding out what this data thing is. But I just tell people, because I've had, I have people call me and they're like going for contracts and, and they go, well, you know, you, you, you allude to you may be sharing data. And I said, well, you may be. I mean, I don't know what the extent is, okay? I don't know. Uh, nobody's been really forthcoming on exactly what kind of data they're collecting to make the geofencing system thing work, where the servers are, where the data is going. You know, I'm just telling you, I don't, I don't know all of the um, particulars on that. But I will say I was in Norway a couple of years ago, and I was uh, the keynote at a symposium. It was a de- closed data loop. Control of the data was very important in the uh, oil and gas industry. They told me that people would fly this. They didn't even have control of the uh, memory, whatever else, and representative from the company would come over and pull it off of the drone. So they never had it really in their possession. So if you look at that, you say, okay, well, you know, uh, oil and gas exploration, you know, a lot of of intel could be gleaned off of that data. And in some cases, it's an industrial espionage, but in the case of like Norway, which, you know, uh, oil is kind of their bag or how they make money, uh, it could be a national security issue. So those are things to look at. Then, you know, you have the other one. The big one is like mining. Oh, God, we're going to, you know, well, you know, uh, precious metals, precious stones, things like that. Very hush hush, very controlled. If bad news were to get out, a company stock could tank. Um, they're not going to want to share. So that's something that, you know, I I think we're going to see more and more of as time rolls on. What is the security of my data? What type of controls do I have? You weren't at the expo, but I did talk about a little bit of it. And I did talk about the three types of data. I have a concept for the types of data. You have one, and I use the upside down wedding cake model. The first, and, you know, let's say cheapest or whatever is probably artistic grade. You know, you take some photos, you might get some photos you can sell or some video for B-roll or whatever. Second grade is commercial grade that you use to sell stuff, cars, houses, grapes, whatever. And that would include TV and movies in there. The third and the top tier of this upside down wedding cake is what I like to call regulatory grade data. 
And this is data that is going to indemnify you from lawsuits and, let's say, regulatory action. And so public utilities may have to use that type of data. They already do for power line inspections and telephone poles and all the rest. All this stuff has to be inspected. All of it is regulated. And it's a repeatable scientific type of process that people use to indemnify themselves against the lawsuit liability and all the rest of that. That's where the money is going to be, and I think in the drone thing. So that all still has to be developed, the data chain, the analysis, uh, things like that. And we're not there yet. And some people are calling it the third wave and yada, yada. We're, we're a few more waves down the, down the road from that happening. What are some of the things that have to happen before that? Those are where you have to have software that's intelligent enough that it can detect anomalies and then uh, not only detect them, but also analyze and, let's say, disseminate solutions to people. I, I really think when you have, you know, at the end of the day, let's say, and even in the ag thing, you have a, a drone that goes out every morning and it does. It's a pre-programmed thing. A lot of people call it autonomous, but it's really it's pre-programmed. That's what IKO calls it. Drone goes out, flies the field of rice or whatever else, comes back in, downloads the data. You have software algorithms that can spot the rice weevil infestation starting off in the very early point. And I don't know if there's a rice weevil. I'm not a agronomist, but I'm just using it for you know simple terms. Anyway, and so the program figures that out. It gives you the GPS location of that. This it just started. Basically, what needs to be done is somebody needs to get over there with a you know backpack sprayer, Roundup, hit that area. Here's what it looks like. It's approximately this big now. You'll need a gallon of applicant, whatever else. And the guy goes to you know the ranch manager. He gets on the blower and says, "Hey, Bill, George, whoever, this is what you need to do. Get the Roundup. Get over here to these coordinates. You go over there and you apply that on there. Okay, have a nice day. That's when I think the value." is going to be there. Not some guy flying three times a week, analyzing all of the data, coming back with a, a report two or three days later, calling the guy or emailing him some long report. People need what's called actionable intelligence and they need it like right now. To your knowledge, is anyone working on that or somewhat close to getting even rudimentary results? I'm sure people are working on it. I'm going to say this is another thing about the drone industry that's very surprising is, you know, I've tried for years to even talk to the military about going out here and finding COTS technology. That's like pretty impressive stuff I've seen. And uh, going out there and getting it and see if we could actually use this stuff now. There are people that are working on all kinds of different programs, uh, hardware, software, sensors, blah, blah, blah. Most of them are doing it and not getting any traction. They don't know who to go to. They can't get any investment. You know, it's kind of sad. So I'm going to say that there are people that are probably working on stuff like this. Hard for them to get traction. Hard for, uh, I would say, a lot of people that are engineers are types that really actually want to solve problems and aren't very good business people. Probably some engineers would disagree with that. So I think people are probably working on it. There's probably already programs. This is another thing I think is kind of funny with the dronosphere is a lot of people like, you know, oh, God, we're going to revolutionize ag with precision ag data. Well, you go talk to ag professionals. They're already just awash, swimming in data. The tractors are collecting data. They, they know when they're harvesting. Yes, it's, it's reactive or whatever. But next year, hey, we know we need more fertilizer here. We have these other problems, blah, blah, blah. They're already collecting this data. So a lot of that, uh, those programs may already kind of exist or may be being worked on. They're just – those people aren't in the dronosphere, and they're not making cell phone apps. I think they're going to have to be a little bit more involved than cell phone apps. And I think that's another thing that we're going to see. You know, some of these uh, drone companies are – you notice how they – I want to say they evolve or people keep shifting their focus on the industry on different things. Have you, have you noticed that? Yes, I have seen some of that. What was hot last year maybe isn't this year, and some companies have had to pivot in response. Well, you know, they're, they're talking points, and they're very exciting, you know. But the reality of it is, is nobody really goes and learns what the issues are for these industries. You know, the, the ad one is funny. Is you, you see these, like even uh, there's several companies now that are making these aerial application drones, 
yeah, it's got two and a half liters, you know, and, and I keep, I mean, what are you going to do? Hit grandma's roses with that? You know, I mean, you know, I saw this video in China. The guy's like at the cornfield. Yeah, the thing flies for like seven or eight minutes, you know? I mean, that's going to be a long, long day doing some corn. So, and then, you know, here in the United States, you know, you have a situation where you, you need a, another license. I think it's 137. And then in the different states, you're, you got uh, pesticides and hazardous waste disposal. And, you know, it goes on and on and on. It really doesn't make sense. So uh, people don't go out there and really look at that. Even even the Yamaha, you know, I don't want to just beat up on the small drones, but carries eight gallons, you know. So I, I'm at the spare. I asked the, the rice farm, I go, well, how, how many gallons are you applying on, you know, acre of rice? Huh, it's about 10 gallons an acre. Okay, great. So you can't even hit, you know, an acre. It's just ridiculous. So I think you have, I call it, you know, kind of like Cinderella's stepsisters trying to, stuff their foot in the glass slipper, you know, well, this drone can do X, Y, and Z. Well, you know, you don't really need to do that. Or that's not really a problem. That was a problem in the sixties. It's not really a problem now. And then people kind of get disappointed and go, well, I, I came up with a solution for something. Yeah, but you know, there are other solutions, you know, and it's like the guy with the backpack sprayer, you know, people are like, well, the Yamaha RMX is $250,000. It's like, you know, you can get a lot of farm labor, Guy can wear the spray backpack. He's got two built-in sensors. He knows what the anomalies look like. And he can either take care of it or report back what problems are. You know? And I went to another thing where they, you know, oh, medical delivery with drones and the zip line guys were there and it was Pillsbury and everybody's talking about how great it is and oh God matter net. And you know, and I'm like, you know, in, in a lot of these countries, you're competing against a kid on a Chinese motorcycle. And he can he can carry a guy that can administer or a girl that can administer inoculations or take blood samples or whatever else. And then, you know, somebody else was like, yeah, that's funny you mentioned that because we did a, another study against another country where it was a kid with a donkey. And man alive, that one's a hard one to beat, you know. Someone remarked to me a few months ago that we can do a lot of things with a drone, but not all of them really make sense, either economically or practically. Sort of gets back to your point about doing the proper research. Well, then and you got to think about the initial investment. Well, I think some of these medical things are good. You know, there are some, some instances where, let's say, the investor might be an, an NGO or whatever is never getting their money back, you know. And the, the business model only really works when you don't count the $100 million that went into developing this. And the other uh, thing that I noticed, too, is it's usually it's the wrong tool for the job. You know, there are a lot of problems with uh, the third or, let's say, developing countries with infrastructure, when the NGOs go away, things like that. The other uh, issues that you have with medicine, and, and this was one of the things early on, I was probably one of the first people to matter. And I talked to, I said, look, you know, if you're going to deliver medication, you have to be able to make it. 99.99999% of the time. If you don't, people are going to die. Okay. And then you're not going to, no one's going to want to be associated with you. And I just saw another effort where, you know, you got these humanitarians, we're going down to the Amazon, man. And they got their foam planes with duct tape and they're going to deliver medication. You know, I sincerely hope the toys make it. You know, it's not burritos. It's not candy bars. You're talking about people's lives. So, you know, you go down there and you play around with that. Uh, you're only going to make yourself look bad and us look bad. And you're going to waste some NGO money that can be spent better elsewhere, you know. So, I don't know. I, I think people have to be more realistic. They do sound like great ideas or whatever else. But, you know, sit back, take in the big picture, and think about these things before you go off half-cocked. And then, you know, you're going to look less foolish at the end of the day. And the rest of us will, too. So, Patrick, we talked about a lot of different things today. As we close, do you have a piece of advice for all of us as to what we should be doing? First off, I'd read the SUAS News because it's a good place to uh, get information. But you'll notice lately I've been writing articles that I've been saying, hey, you know what, you should probably write your congressperson and, and tell them how you feel about some of these different proposed regulation what you think your future is going to be like. Because if you think you want to be in this business and you think you want to be economically viable, 
the whole thing is is really kind of hanging in a precarious place right now. And as I had said earlier, there's really nobody advocating for you. It's too bad. I mean, I, even myself, I mean, I've told the FAA, I'm not advocating or doing advocacy because I don't want to. I really can't afford it both in the time and money that it takes to really, you know, have some kind of concerted effort. So really, the only thing I can tell people is that you're going to have to be kind of rely on yourself to be grassroots and do something because really nobody's looking out for you. And it's sad, but that's the way it is. So that would be my advice. If something comes along, you see a story, oh, hey, you know, maybe it's a call to action, you should do it. If not, even if it's not a call to action, you know, think about it. When you see something like that, that bill you were uh, talking to me, Feinstein's bill or whatever, hey, write a letter. Hey, uh, you know, I do this for a living and, and I don't think it's good. That's the only advice that I can get. And the other thing is, is don't be afraid to call the FAA. Call the Unmanned Aircraft Systems Integration Office. Call Earl Lawrence. Call Hoot Gibson. Hey, man, um, you know, you guys work for us. I don't like this. I don't think this is good. Hey, if you guys thought about that, they'll probably hate my guts for telling you to call them or email them. But remember that the government works for you. You don't like something? Call them up. Let them know. Thank you, Patrick, for being on the show. Well, I appreciate you having me back on and, uh, you know, letting me uh, share some of this stuff with the audience. Again, I hope people take this and and learn from it and say, hmm, okay, what am I going to do to be smarter than the average bear? And that's really the whole point of even being on today. That's it for episode 113 of the Drone Radio Show. I hope you enjoyed listening to Patrick Egan of the SUAS News in hearing his perspectives. I want to thank Patrick for taking the time to speak with me. If you want to learn more about the SUAS News or want to connect with Patrick, check out the website at suasnews.com. You can also follow Patrick on Twitter under the name of The Drone Dealer. If you like The Drone Radio Show, please consider supporting the podcast with a small donation. The content is always free, but for as little as $1 per month, you can help defray the cost of production. To donate, go to patreon.com slash drone radio show. Thanks for listening. Your support means a lot to me, and I hope you'll listen to more episodes of the Drone Radio Show podcast to hear how others are using drones for business, fun, and research. For the Drone Radio Show, I'm Randy Gores. This has been the Drone Radio Show podcast. More information on today's show can be found on our website at www.droneradioshow.com. If you're using drone technology for business, fun, or research, and would like to share your experience on the show, please visit our website and fill out a guest appearance application. And don't forget to follow us on your favorite social media channels.